Okay, so I, I want to start uh, by talking about how wonderful it is to be uh, with ASON tonight. Um, I've been in this uh, role for two years. Uh, I meet many, many different uh, advocacy groups, many different community groups. Every once in a while, a group actually captures my imagination and my heart. Uh, and ASON is one of those groups that has actually captured my imagination and my heart. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, the groups that actually do that to me are those groups that are of the people they speak for, for the people they speak for, and by the people they speak for. Uh, and you all uh, deserve very much uh, an applause uh, for being at, uh, for this community. So I am really, really proud uh, to be here tonight with you. Um, what I'd like to do uh, over the next few minutes uh, is to talk to you a little bit about why we, uh, what we do uh, and where our opportunities uh, are for partnership. Um, the real heroes, by the way, are not up here but are actually in this room. People like Henry uh, are the real heroes who are really uh, working to make a real difference uh, for autistic people uh, in, in, in the United States today. Uh, but I want to talk to you about where we have an opportunity uh, to be partners, where we have an opportunity uh, to make a difference uh, for the autistic community. Um, I bring you greetings tonight uh, on behalf of Secretary Sebelius and the entire department. Uh, I reviewed uh, the ASON uh, website very carefully before I came here tonight, and I was struck and how much uh, of what ASON considers priorities with respect to, to health care track exactly the priorities uh, of our office. So we do two big things. Uh, first of all, uh, we enforce the civil rights laws that prohibit discrimination by organizations that receive federal funds. That means hospitals. That means a lot of uh, uh, doctor's offices. That means state social services agencies. Uh, that means a lot of people with whom you may interact uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We also enforce the Health Information Rights Law, that you may know as HIPAA, uh, which protect not only your rights to have your health information be private and secure, but also your rights to have access to that information, to be real participants uh, in your health care. And how do we do that? Uh, we do that in really in three basic ways. Way number one is we engage in enforcement. Uh, enforcement means uh, we do an investigation. Uh, if we find that there's been a violation of these laws, uh, we inform the organization that there's been a violation, and we require them to correct it. We actually have a, a very specific penalty that we can impose on organizations that don't comply with the law. Uh, and you'll understand in a minute why we would almost never use this penalty. Because the penalty that we can impose is the complete removal of all federal funding from that organization. That means that when we take enforcement action, just about every time the organizations come into compliance with the things that we uh, ask for. Now, those work investigations come to us in two different ways. First, there are individual complaints. Uh, people call us, they write us letters, uh, they actually go to our online complaint portal and they make complaints. Uh, but one of the things that we learned in our work is that we don't always protect the people who most need us by waiting for them to come to us. So now we go to them. Uh, we go to the organizations that we regulate and we investigate them. We just show up and do compliance reviews. We need to be in touch with organizations like yours for us to tell us where we need to be looking, where the problems are, what issues we need to be focusing on, what organizations we need to be focusing on. The second big thing we do is develop policy. We develop guidances uh, on all kinds of issues, community living, uh, uh, protection of persons with disabilities, privacy. Uh, we also do regulations. Right now, we're working on a very significant regulation, uh, an anti-discrimination re uh, regulation that sits in the Affordable Care Act. One of the most transformative uh, uh, civil rights laws is sitting right in the heart of the Affordable Care Act which for the first time, among other things, requires those health information exchanges not to discriminate based on gender, based on disability, based on race and national origin. Uh, 
so we're working to develop regulations. We're already enforcing that law even without the benefit of regulations. And then the final thing that we do is what we're doing right now, and that's education and outreach. Uh, and those of you who know us well know that it's true that we will go anywhere and do just about anything to make sure that people learn what we're all about. Uh, we have offices in 12 different cities uh, throughout the United States. We've empowered all of our staff to engage in outreach work. So just about anywhere where you would like one of our folks to come out and talk, come out and explain what we do, uh, those opportunities exist. So what does that mean in terms of uh, actual uh, priorities? So one of the things uh, is our focus on community living and homestead. Now, Olmstead needs to be understood as much more than uh, making sure that people who don't want to be in institutions don't need to be in institutions who aren't in institutions. That's sort of the first step along the road of the line. What Olmstead really means is that the ultimate goal is that if you are a person with a disability, you can live in the community just like anybody else. You can work. You can go to school. You can go to church. You can have the same life that everybody else with whatever supports and services that you need. Uh, so one of the uh, issues that we work on in collaboration with uh, the Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division, with the Department of Labor, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development is making sure uh, that those rights are really given meaning. Uh, and so part of what we do there is the enforcement work uh, about which uh, we talked before, but we're also really working on education. We're also working on data gathering, because very often uh, it's not necessarily the case where we need to go in and actually do an investigation and enforcement, but instead to gather data that exposes where the problems are, uh, that actually identifies who's doing well on these issues, who's not doing so. Um, the second issue, uh, upon uh, which we've been focusing uh, is the idea of full autonomy and participation uh, in healthcare decision making. Uh, and so, as you well know, there has been way too long a history uh, of autistic communities not being able to be full participants in their in their healthcare, and very often being discriminated against in the healthcare uh, system without basis based on their status. Uh, so Ari Neiman, one of your wonderful leaders, and I had a lot of discussions recently, for example, about the issue of organ transplantation. Uh, and about those instances in which the decisions about organ transplantation uh, are being made in a discriminatory manner. Uh, in, a, in a manner that, in fact, uh, often denies life-giving therapy uh, to people who both need it and will be able to, to fully utilize it and have wonderful lives if they yeah, if they had. So we're focusing on that issue uh, along with art, but it means much more. Uh, it means much more than organ transplantation. It's looking at all kinds uh, of issues about how hospitals make decisions, how physicians make decisions, how people are treated, what autonomy they're given uh, in the healthcare setting. And so when I talk about art eating you, is we need to know where those issues are. Uh, we need to hear from you uh, as to what, what issues we need to be looking at. Uh, along those lines, and I'm very grateful uh, to Ari, who's come to visit uh, us on a number of occasions, uh, to really lay out some of the things that ASAN has learned about where these kinds of issues uh, are to be found. And then finally, uh, I mentioned that we enforce uh, the privacy laws. And uh, uh, privacy laws really mean, as I said before, they are health information rights laws. First of all, let me begin uh, by making one thing uh, as absolutely clear uh, as I can. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, as we've been talking about gun violence, uh, there has been a lot of talk about uh, curtailment uh, privacy rights. Uh, and one thing that I want to be 100% clear about uh, is the fact that you are autistic, the fact that you are a person with a disability, does not in any way diminish your privacy protections under code. And we will see to it that that is the case. We're absolutely committed to that. 
Um, but I also said we're talking about health information rights. So it's not just the privacy of your information, you're being able to control who sees your health information in land, uh, land, but it's also your access uh, to that information. We've actually uh, launched a campaign called Information is Powerful Medicine. Uh, because when you go to the doctor, when you go to a hospital, uh, you deserve, you have a right to be fully involved uh, in your health care. And that means if you want your health record, if you want to pull together all your health records to be your own health advocate, uh, then that is a right uh, that we protect. And in fact, uh, it is so important to us that if you call uh, our uh, central intake unit uh, here in the CO, if you'll file uh, an online complaint, very often we're able to help you uh, get access to your health records within a matter of days. So what we'll do, rather than let the complaint sort of sit around and go over many months and months, we'll get, we'll pick up the phone, we will call your provider, say this is the law, make sure that you send uh, uh, these uh, health records uh, to these folks. And we've had uh, many uh, uh, wonderful uh, opportunities uh, for collaboration with so many people. One of the things that I'm uh, really proud of, I want to introduce uh, Robin Sue Proposi, our civil rights director. Uh, she's been working along with uh, uh, Judith, uh, <coughs> who I just had the opportunity to meet tonight, uh, on working on this disability rights treaty. And I'm optimistic. I think we might get I think we might actually see that treaty happen. Uh, because, in fact, the United States should be the leader of the world on this issue. We should be at the front of the line uh, on these issues, especially when we're talking about uh, the fact that this is the 50th anniversary of the Mental Retardation Facilities and Community Mental Health Centers Construction Act of 1963, which President Kennedy signed 50 years ago, back in 1963. So the fact that we're still talking about community living as a goal 50 years later really tells you how much work is still ahead of us. Really tells you how much uh, we still have to do in this area. Uh, but I'm really proud to have the kind of partners uh, that I have here tonight. Uh, I'm proud of the fact uh, that we're going to be doing this together. I'm proud of the fact that Henry's part of the next generation of leaders after people like me get old and tired. Uh, and so I'm really thrilled to be here with everybody tonight. Uh, I guess if that was your salad course, that makes me a sore day. Uh, so uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening.